Now, hopefully you're able to see my screen and you can see the slides I have. We're discussing as our uh, point of interest here this morning, the ordinance of baptism. And that's a pretty big subject actually, in a lot of ways. Um, I'm not going to go through every basic fundamental point of baptism. Hopefully we are um, basically understanding certain aspects of it. I will review some lightly and quickly. But baptism comes from a Greek word, baptizo, which means to dip, to sink, to immerse. It comes from another word, uh, bapto, um, which means to dip. And so baptism is, is, is an immersion. It's dipping into something. Some of the early mentions of baptism in the scriptures, for instance, in Matthew chapter 3, and starting in verse 7 through 9, and I'll give you a chance to turn there or make sure you write the, the notes down, and I did send um, Brother Samuel a copy of these slides, so if anyone would like to have them, I'm sure he can make them available to you. But it says that when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, that's speaking of John the Baptist, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits met for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So John was preaching here to the people, and he was asking them to bring forth fruits met, or the, the kind of fruit that true repentance would bring. Continuing in chapter 10, in verses 11 and uh, 10 and 11, Matthew chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. It says, now also, John speaking, he says, the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So here's another baptism spoken of, another immersion, if you please, spoken of, one with the Holy Spirit and with fire. These, these references um, must have brought two verses to the minds of those people who heard John. I think the first one would be in Joel chapter 2. If you'd like to turn with me to Joel 2, verses 28 and 29. Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. It says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And then in connection with that, we have this reference in Malachi, Malachi chapter three and verses two through five. It says, who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner, and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, as in, and as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers, and against those that oppress the harling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turns aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. And of course, you remember John the Baptist and his preaching. The different people came, and the public came and said, what should we do? And he said, exact no more than what is due. The, um, some of the soldiers and others came and said, what should we do? And he said, you know, just take the right wages, get the right wages to people and things like this. Excuse me for the background noise. I'll give it a pause. We may have a few announcements occasionally, hopefully not too many. Both fire and water are naturally purifying agents. And therefore, it's very appropriate that both of these should be used to represent the regeneration of the heart, which baptism is a symbol of in many respects. Baptism has many aspects of, in the plan of salvation. It represents, and we'll look at some of those in a bit. But because the symbols of the fire and water are both used, it shows that God wants to doubly purify us, I believe. Now, John's baptism 
was of the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And again, his, his focus of baptism was that the people would repent of their sins. Now, we should just take a, a minute and pause and remember that the, the, the concept of repentance is much more than just being sorry for our sins. The, va the basic verb form of the Greek word we translate repent means to, to change your thinking, to have a turnabout in your thinking. And of course, the Bible says, as the man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And if we can change the heart, the mind, the thinking of the individual, then we can change the whole individual. And that's why John the Baptist wanted to lay the ax at the root of the tree. If I have a tree that I don't like, I can go to the tree and I can start plucking off the different leaves. And as I pluck off the leaves, I think I'm trying to kill the tree. But the leaves just keep growing back. But if I take an ax and I cut the tree at its roots and cut off the supply from the roots, then the leaves will naturally fall off. You know, Ellen White, she mentioned this concept when she was talking about jewelry and um, the, the outward adornings. She said, you know, we can try to pluck them off the people, but it's better to lay the ax at the root of the tree and then they won't come back at all. Anyhow, in Luke chapter three and verse three, here again, we have this concept of a baptism for repentance. It says, and he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So this was the, the baptism of John. Now, we know that that baptism, just looking at a couple fundamental points quickly, was a baptism that needed much water. In John chapter 3 and verse 23, John 3, 23, it says, And John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salome because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. And I think it's pretty obvious that these texts with the, the very understanding of the definition of the word baptize or baptism in the Greek would prohibit a type of sprinkling baptism that sometimes we, we see in various churches. Now, the one being baptized and the one baptizing went into the water. They would go into the water together. And we read an example of that here in Acts chapter 8. And we mentioned this um, a night or two ago about uh, Philip and the baptism he had with the Ethiopian eunuch. And in verse 36, it says, and as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they, that's plural, they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. But here we learn also that we must believe in Jesus as our Savior with our whole heart. Because if we don't, baptism is meaningless to us. Baptism simply becomes a, a work of the flesh if there's no spirit involved in it. Now, there are many different modes of baptism performed today in various churches. Some churches baptize by immersion, laying the candidate back into the water. Uh, some sprinkle. Uh, some churches actually take the candidate and push them face forward into the water three times, once for the Father, once for the Son, once for the Holy Spirit, a type of uh, Trinitarian baptism. But in Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 5, the scripture says that we have one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One baptism. And of course, it goes on to say that we have one God and Father of us all. But we're not to, we're not to give um, credit. We're not to give approval to multitudinous forms of baptism. Now, the, a principal doctrine of Christ that prepares for perfection is baptism. In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, he says, Therefore, leaving the principles 
of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Paul is not saying that these things are bad, but he's saying, you know, we should have had the milk of these things. They are foundational principles of the doctrine of Christ. And we use those then as a basis to go on to more meatier subjects. In fact, especially the subject of perfection. Now, baptism is a symbol, we know, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And our experience with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. In Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, Paul says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He's been talking about grace and how grace is sufficient. But now do we continue in sin that we can have this grace abounding? He goes on to say, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. And so he speaks about us here being baptized into Christ, that we are to be dead to sin. When Christ died on the cross, he died more than a physical death. He died a death to sin. Sin tried to hold on to Christ. Satan tried to tempt Christ to sin, to to be a part of sin, but he would have nothing to do with it. And we need to each day die to sin. Now, when I was uh, younger, when I was a young boy at home, for a period of time, my father worked in funeral homes. He worked as an embalmer, the person who prepares a dead person for presentation and burial. And so because of that connection, at times, I was around dead bodies, and I was in embalming rooms. And though it's probably not the most pleasant, sweet thing to think about, but it's just a reality of this existence we have right now, that we are under sin and death is here. Physical death is here for us all. But one thing I learned about a person who's dead, and that is that they are totally unresponsive to anything you do to them. If there is a dead corpse on the table, you can speak to it, it'll never speak back. You can tap it, it won't jerk, it won't respond. You can pinch it, it won't set up. You can begin to slice on it, and it doesn't react. It is dead. God wants us to be dead to sin, so that no matter how sin comes to us, no matter how attractive or alluring it may appear, no matter how tempting it comes to us, we are dead to it. We don't respond to it. I hope that makes sense because it's so important. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12, again, baptism being a symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It says, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of operation of God who raised him from the dead. So, God raised Christ from the dead. And the same way we can be raised into a newness of life. Not only do we die with Christ, but we don't stay dead. We come up into a new life. We are born again in Christ. In Romans continuing in chapter 6, verses 5 through 8, he says, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Praise the Lord. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And so, beloved, we have the death the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And this is, in a physical way, symbolized. 
when a person is lowered into the water in baptism. It represents his dying, his being buried. When you go underwater, you can't breathe. There's no way a person can naturally breathe underwater. And when you don't breathe, you die. It's a symbol of death. But when you come up out of the water, you're able to breathe. And so that represents and symbolizes life to us. Continuing in Romans chapter 6, he says, Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, hath no more dominion over you. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon or believe ye also yourselves to be dead in the sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, friends, I come to Jesus just as I am. I am sinful. I am polluted. I am filthy. But I can say, Lord, I will repent of my sins. I want to be buried with you in baptism. I want to confess my sins. I want to be raised in new life. I need you to give me a new heart, Lord. It's just that simple. Just give me a new heart. And God will give us a new heart. And we are to believe. He says, likewise, in the same way that Jesus died, we are to believe in the same way that we are dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And this is why faith is so essential. Faith is such an essential ingredient here because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, we can't believe. Now, baptism is for those who ever possibly have the opportunity, a necessary event to be saved. It follows conversion and new birth. In John chapter 3, and verse 5, Jesus answered to Nicodemus, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He makes it very clear this is something that's necessary. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, you know, it is true that there was the case of the thief on the cross who could not be baptized. But he would have been baptized. If he could have come off that cross, he would have been baptized. He would have followed the Lord Jesus in every detail. But he didn't have that chance. And Jesus' baptism helps to make up for his lack of baptism. And G Jesus doesn't expect his friends to do something that becomes physically impossible to us. But for most people, the ability to be baptized is not a hard thing to arrange. And it's something God wants from us because it's an outward expression that we are a Christian. It's a public demonstration that God has given us a new heart and that we're not the same person we used to be and that he has now given us a new life and we want to testify of that new life. We want to praise and exalt our savior for what he's done for us. It is, if you please, an outward type of an inward cleansing. In Acts chapter 22, verse 16, says, and now why tarest thou arise, be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Again, baptism is something by immersion, but it's being immersed into Christ. In Galatians 3.27, he says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You see, friends, we sometimes think that baptism is just simply getting people wet. OK, um, but really, before we are even immersed in the water, we should be immersed in the word of God. We should be immersed in Christ and his Holy Spirit. And, uh, and then the baptism is simply the outward symbol that an inward process has already happened. Baptism is entrance into the church. You know, we don't baptize people who just want to be baptized without joining the body of believers, because that's not biblical. In the Bible, in Acts chapter 2, in verse 41 and 47, there on the day of Pentecost, it tells us plainly. It says, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same that day, they were added, excuse me, and the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. In verse 47, it says, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. It says they were added unto them. They were added unto the people who were making up the church of God now. And if we don't want to be associated with the church of God, friends, it's because we are in rebellion 
against Christ. Our hearts are not perfect with Christ. We, we can say, well, you know, I, I just want to be a follower of Jesus. I just want to follow him. And I don't need to be a member of a church. I don't need to be a member of a fellowship. I don't need to be a, a part of the body of Christ, this great worldwide movement sharing the three angels messages that he's given to us. We can say that, but it's a lie. It's a lie to say that we want to follow Christ, but not follow the teachings of Christ. And part of the teachings of Christ is that when we are baptized, we have become a part of the body of Christ. We become a part of his church. We become a part of those who are called out. Now, we also mentioned uh, a little bit the other day about who may baptize. Normally, we think of this as a duty for the minister or maybe, maybe the ordained elder. But in Acts chapter 8, we have the story there of Philip. And having a revival first at Samaria, and there were people being baptized. In verse 12, it says, but when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And we understand that Philip had to be the one baptizing them because the apostles were all still in Jerusalem. The Bible specifically tells us that. And in fact, it says later that because of everything that was going on after these people were baptized, Peter and John were sent down to check things out. And then, of course, in, in, in an instance that we alluded to earlier, when Philip was with the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8, 38, it says, and he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he, that is Philip, baptized him. So here we see an example of deacons, those who are ordained to do the work of God, either as a deacon, an elder, or minister, they're all qualified to baptize and to uh, help with this service. Now I have a little notice here. Be patient. Because we're going to discuss a subject that for some people now may be a little touchy. It may be a little difficult. But we're just going to look at some evidence. And I'll let you draw your conclusions. I've drawn a few for, for me, and I hope that they can help you. But we're just going to look at some evidence, and we're going to look at some things here. But what about this idea of a baptismal formula? Because there is some controversy about that. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, we have there the record where Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. How do we understand this? What does this mean? Because we know that most churches, all Trinitarian churches, when they baptize someone, they use a type of formula that they speak when the person's baptized. And I looked up this, this expression, baptismal formula, and I couldn't find where inspiration ever uses it. So it's a man-made term of itself. And, uh, but let's just look at some examples of how the apostles must have understood this command. Because if we want to have an example, it should be from the Bible. Amen? It should be from the Bible. So as we look in the New Testament, specifically in the book of Acts, we have some examples. Here we start, here we start in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. <clears throat> then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We're getting some feedback, brother. I, there was just a change to something a minute ago, and I'm getting feedback now. I don't know if anyone else is. Maybe no one else is. Okay, maybe it's better now. Um, in Acts 10 and verse 48, and you might want to write these verses down if you don't have them down. Acts 2.38, and now Acts 10.48. It says, and he, speaking about Peter, commanded them, or Cornelius and his brethren, to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So here we see that they were baptized in the name of the Lord. We mentioned about those baptized by Philip. They were baptized in the name of Jesus, Acts 8.16. For as yet he was not fallen upon of them, that's speaking of the Holy Spirit, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, Acts 8.16. And then this is Paul at Ephesus, Acts chapter 19, verses 4 and 5. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. And we, we looked at those verses earlier this morning. 
saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, these people were taught by Paul. These people had instruction by Paul. And it says that when they were baptized, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, my question is, where did Paul get his information? Maybe Paul was mistaken. Maybe Paul didn't understand this issue. But notice in Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, what Paul says about his receiving the gospel. He says, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For neither received it, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. You remember a little of your church history that when uh, Saul, he was Saul at that time, first met Jesus on the Damascus Road and had the scales lifted off his eyes, that he went to Arabia and he spent several months there. And he says that he was taught personally of Christ during this time. So if, if Paul should have been baptizing in some other way, surely Christ would have taught him this. Now, there's no record in the Bible of anyone baptizing in three separate names, of three different or separate individual persons. There are a few possibilities that could explain why the disciples always baptized in the name of Jesus when we have this account in Matthew 28:19 where Jesus said, baptize in, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, number one, it's possible the disciples may have been in direct rebellion against Jesus. But I don't think that's a very good prob probability, friends, because, first of all, in the book of Acts in chapter 2, it says that they were filled with the Holy Ghost on, on the day of Pentecost. And they also taught us later that, uh, that God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey him. And so it's very unlikely that they were in disobedience to Christ in doing what they did. Number two, they may have misunderstood what he said. Seems very unlikely. Seems very unlikely that Peter and John and those people who were filled with the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost would be understood, would be misunderstood, would, would have misunderstood Christ. It seems very unlikely that the Apostle Paul, who was taught directly of Christ, would have misunderstood his teaching. It seems unlikely that they all would have misunderstood his teaching. Point number three. Matthew 28, 19 may be a gloss. A gloss is a, uh, a portion of, of the Bible that is not an actual genuine piece of scripture. Uh, so some people theorize that Jesus never gave this command. And I'm going to look at this particular argument a little bit more later. The fourth point, the disciples understood the command of Jesus differently than most Trinitarians understand it today. And I'd like to say that I think point number four makes the most sense of these or any other choices that we can look at. Because to literally baptize someone in the name of a person, we would need to know that person's personal name. Like, for instance, Yahweh, Jehovah, or other similar spellings is the personal name of the Father. Jesus sometimes is called Yahshua or other similar spellings, but he has a personal name. But the scriptures nowhere give a name for the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is like a title. It is a descriptive title, but it is not a personal name. The Bible does not even hint that such a name exists. And so we can see that Jesus is not giving a specific formula for words for the preacher to recite a baptism. And, 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 and in Matthew 20, 19, by the way, he's to baptize in the name, and that's singular. It's singular in English. It's singular in the Greek. It's not plural. It's not names. I was in Africa one time in the country of Ghana. Some of you maybe been there. And there's a brother there that has, at least at that time, he had a radio station. And they were broadcasting the, the message out far and wide as they could and having meetings and things. But they had invited some Sunday keeping ministers to come on to the radio, onto a live broadcast, to discuss the doctrine of the Trinity. And they asked me to, you know, to, to be there to speak toward these points uh, with these Sunday keeping ministers and to let everybody just have a chance to, you know, share their ideas. And, uh, of course, with the idea being that we were going to show that their ideas really weren't scriptural ideas at all, which really worked out. 
but we were closing up the, the hour that we had been appointed. And I asked one of these Sunday keeping Trinitarians, I said, in Matthew 28, 19, it says baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And I said, does the Father have a name? He says, yes, it's, it's Jehovah. I said, good. I said, does the Son have a name? He said, yes, it's Jesus. I said, very good. I said, does the Holy Spirit have a name? And he got real quiet for just a minute and he said, Holy Spirit. I said, no, no, no. I said, Holy Spirit. Holy is an adjective. Spirit is something. It's not a personal name. What is the name of the Holy Spirit? And he thought and he thought, and it was just about the time for the meeting to stop. And the man producing the show said, wait a minute. He says, you know, we, this has been so good. I think people have been appreciating it. We could continue this tomorrow if y'all will come back tomorrow. And I said, I can come back tomorrow. And the Sunday keeping ministry, he said he could come back tomorrow. And I said, you know, and this will give our brother all night to look through the scriptures and find the personal name of the Holy Spirit. So we came back 24 hours later, 23 hours later by that time. And uh, I said, now, you know, our brother, he's had all night and most of the morning to figure this out. And he's going to now tell us what is the name, the personal name of the Holy Spirit, brother. And he looked at me and just said, Holy Spirit. I said, no, no, <laughs> not, not, not a personal name. Anyhow, of course, he couldn't show a personal name for it at all. Now, we know, as I put in my note here, we know this, first of all, because of a concern names that all the recorded examples of people being baptized after the command was given to show that it was done in the name of Jesus. And secondly, because it would not be possible to li literally baptize in the proper name of the Holy Spirit, because the Bible makes no mention of such a name. But I'd like to propose to you that the word name in the Bible often refers to a person's character. Jacob's name, which meant seer or cheat, was changed to Israel. He was a prince and an overcomer because his character changed. The word name in Matthew 28, 19 has reference to the character rather than the proper names of individuals. Once we realize that Christ was commissioning his disciples, let me just say, Okay, thank you for the pause. Once we realize that Christ was commissioning his disciples to baptize into the character of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, it's easier for us to understand these words. Now, I may have one more point on this. Uh, this command is closely connected with the command to teach. Christ wants his disciples to understand the truth about God, his Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three of these are vital in a Christian's life. The Father loves us so much that he gave his Son to die for our sins. And he gives his Spirit to guide us in our lives. And if a person lacks the knowledge and experience of any of these aspects, his relationship with God will suffer. And this is at least one of the reasons why Christ specifically mentions all three. The Bible says that we have broken the Father's law. We have sinned against God. But we have salvation through Christ. And we receive the comfort and the day-by-day -day guidance through the Holy Spirit. We need repentance toward God. We need faith in Christ. And we must have the Holy Spirit to live the Christian life. So all three of these elements are essential in our Christian experience. And, and I think can be perfectly brought into a baptismal service. You know, as we acknowledge our repentance toward God, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have the desire to receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, but, but the Bible didn't leave any specific, quote, baptismal formula that we find that was ever followed um, in an exact way, ever. And so to say that a minister has to say a certain set of words, and if they don't say those exact set of words, the, the person may not have a valid baptism. I, I don't think that's that's the right thing to do. I mean, after all, maybe we need to to go to the to the Greek words that are actually in the text, not translate them into English or not translate them into into an African language or Spanish or French or something else, because we might lose something in the translation or it might not just say the exact same thing. Maybe we should go and beyond that. Maybe we should study the Aramaic and try to find what was the exact Aramaic words that Jesus might have said. There's just a lot of problems here in this. Now, I said I would discuss about the issue of Matthew 28, and is it a gloss? 
There are accusations that Matthew 28, 19 is a gloss, not part of the original scriptures, but was added later by men. And one of the leading arguments about that concerns um, some, some work of Eusebius. And uh, he had written some material called The Proof of the Gospel. And in that, he had written this, and I have it typed up here where it's still easy to read. It says, um, with one word and voice, he said to his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations in my name, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. That's from Proofs of the Gospel by Eusebius, Book 3, Chapter 6, page 152, which is what I have um, back up here. It's just a, it's a translated, of course, version. He didn't write in English, obviously. Um, and sometimes some of, our, some of the people that I know that are in this movement have been sympathetic with this view. And perhaps partially because Eusebius, Eusebius was not uh, in all respects uh, an Orthodox Catholic. Uh, he actually uh, sided to a great degree with certain Arian kinds of concepts and principles. But friends, Eusebius was not an inspired individual. Ellen White, who was an inspired individual, quotes Matthew 28, 19, hundreds of times. I didn't take time to try to find each individual reference because we know sometimes there are statements that are repeated or reprinted in devotional books and others, but there were like about 350 references to the exact quote of Matthew 28, 19 in her writings. So it would be pretty safe to say there's at least a hundred or, or many more uh, individual statements. However, interestingly, she never quotes 1 John 5, 7. And some people have sur surmised or, or hypothesized that 1 John 5, 7 is a gloss. In fact, the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary states it as much. They say it should not ever be used to prove the Trinity. And it probably is a gloss. But nevertheless, I'm not going to try to tell people it's not part of Scripture. And if we try to tell people that Matthew 20, 19 is not part of the Scripture, we are going to lose a lot of good people because there are people who trust the scriptures. And if we go start telling them that this part of the Bible is not inspired, tomorrow they're gonna to wonder what next portion of the scripture that we don't agree with is not inspired to us. And they will not have confidence in us because they don't believe we have confidence in the scriptures. I think it's much easier to try to understand and explain this verse in Matthew 20, 19, than to, to get rid of it. Now, another uh, argument against Matthew 20, 19, comes from the book Introduction to Christianity, or at least it, 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 they claim it comes from the book Introduction to Christianity by Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, who became later Pope Benedict. And there was this quotation going around, oh, it's been seven or eight years ago, a lot. And I still see it on websites that are promoting this idea that Matthew 20, 19 is a gloss. And it says this, the basic form of our Matthew 28, 19, Trinitarian profession of faith took shape during the course of the second and third centuries in connection with the ceremony of baptism. It says, so far as its place of origin is concerned, the text, Matthew 20, 19, comes from the city of Rome. And this is a supposed statement of Ratzinger, sourced from emails and various websites. Now, notice that Matthew 28, 19 in Trinitarian, and then Matthew 28, 19 is in parentheses, in parentheses. If you see something in a book printed in parentheses like that, that's supposed to indicate it's part of the author's own uh, text, something the author has inserted. But I read this and I thought, this just doesn't make sense. I don't believe this is true, but maybe it is. If it is, I need to know. And so I went online and this book was published a few years back. It's not a new book, but I was able to find a copy and I paid the money and bought a copy. And here's what the text actually says. Getting a little of the context. The answers can only be found by looking at the concrete shape of Christian belief. And this is now, and this we now mean to consider using the so-called Apostles' Creed. Now notice Ratzinger is talking about the Apostles' Creed as a guiding thread. It may be useful to preface the discussion with a few facts about the origin and structure of the creed. Again, he's talking about the Apostles' Creed. These will, at the same time, throw some light on the legitimacy of the procedure. The basic form of our profession of faith took shape during the course 
of the second and third centuries in connection with the ceremony of baptism. So far as its place of origin is concerned, the text comes from the city of Rome, but its internal origin lies in worship more precisely in the conferring of baptism. And then he goes on later mentions Matthew 28, but notice in these portions where he talks about the text and he talks about our profession, Matthew 28, 19 is not there. Someone has inserted that and they have done a disservice to this, to this Catholic and they've done a disservice to anyone who has read and believed it. He's, the text he's talking about is the Apostles' Creed here. The, um, the, uh, the profession of faith he's talking about is not Matthew 28, 19, the Trinitarian formula from Matthew 2018, but it's about the Apostles' Creed, which obviously does mention the Trinitarian doctrine, but it mentions other things as well. So, so if you've seen this quotation, like I've got it on this slide, if you've seen that quotation floating around, it's not an accurate quote. People are misquoting. And when we do that, friends, we are lying. We are bearing false witness. And that, you know, the Catholics, the popes, they've done enough bad things. We don't need to make up bad things that they say or about them. We don't need to do that. Now, let's look at a few statements from the testimonies. And I want to speak about these because I'm sure they're on your mind. The ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper are two monumental pillars, one without and one within the church. Upon these ordinances, Christ has inscribed the name of the true God as Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 91, paragraph 1. And there starts a whole section. There's several pages there on baptism. Excuse me. <clears throat> and I would encourage you to read that whole section through. There's all kinds of practical counsel. Counsel such as helping make sure that people are properly prepared. We don't want to be baptizing people who don't know what they're getting into. We certainly don't want to be baptizing people who don't know the gospel and aren't committed fully to Christ. It speaks about not rushing candidates into baptism. And yet, we look in the Bible, like on the book of Acts, the people heard Peter and the apostles preach and they got baptized that very day. In fact, in virtually every case, in the, in, the, in the book of Acts, where someone was baptized, they were either baptized from what they heard that day or from the day before. But we need to understand that their situation was very different than many of our situations are today. In their day, the people understood, especially those people who had come to Jerusalem at, at, for the Passover, they were Jewish people. They understood the Jewish economy. They understood the sacrifices. They understood the law of God. They understood the Seventh-day Sabbath. They understood health principles and things like that. What they simply needed was the revelation that this coming Messiah they were expecting was actually Jesus Christ. And when they received that, they could be baptized fairly quickly because they were already grounded in those other things. We meet people today who may know nothing about Christianity hardly. They're very, very ignorant and they have a lot to learn. And we don't want to, um, we don't want to baptize people until we're sure that they're sure, you know. But just as soon as people are sure and just they have given their lives to Christ, we should baptize them. You know, we were told, you know, why tarryest thou, arise and be baptized, calling on the name of the Lord. We, we don't want to put people in probation, friends. If someone comes to us and they've learned the truth and they, they give their lives to the Lord and we see the fruit in their lives, we, I've heard of churches, I've heard of churches in different nations, Adventist groups, who have put people on probation and they make them come to church and live the right life for like a year before they can be baptized. But friends, that's not biblical. That's not according to the spirit of prophecy, either one. That is just trying to set ourselves up as being so good that you gotta come up and be where I'm at. And that's salvation by works, and that's not good. Continuing in paragraph two of that same page. Christ has made baptism the sign of entrance into his spiritual kingdom. He has made this a positive condition with which all must comply who wish to be acknowledged as under the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Before man can find a home in the church, before passing the threshold of God's spiritual kingdom, he is to receive the impress of the divine name, the Lord, our righteousness. And of course, we know that that name in, in, from Jeremiah 23, 6, it belongs to Christ. 
belongs to Christ. But here it speaks about being under the authority of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But she doesn't say being baptized in a threefold name there. However, if we come down to paragraph three, she says, baptism is a most solemn renunciation of the world. Those who are baptized in the, into the threefold name, again, singular, threefold name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, at the very entrance of their Christian life, declare publicly that they have forsaken the service of Satan and have become members of the royal family, children of the heavenly king. That's to volume six, page 91, paragraph three. So we have this and we have some other statements. We have this statement. This is from Spirit of Prophecy, volume two, page 136 in paragraph three. It says, the prejudice of the Jews was aroused because the disciples of Jesus did not use the exact words. Oh, now we're talking about exact words of John and the rite of baptism. John baptized under repentance, but the disciples of Jesus, on profession of faith, baptized in the name. Now, notice she doesn't say names. Again, she says, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The teachings of John were in perfect harmony with those of Jesus. Yet, his disciples became jealous for fear of his influence, for fear his influence was dim diminishing. A dispute arose between them and the disciples of Jesus in regard to the form of words proper to use of baptism and finally as to the right of the latter to baptize at all. So here's a statement about this. How do we relate to this? Well, Ellen White quotes, as I said, Matthew 28, 19, a lot of times. But she also quotes Acts 2.38 at least 13 different times. We find the phrase baptized in the name of Jesus six times, such as this is in Acts of the Apostles, page 283, paragraph 1. With deep interest and grateful, wondering joy, the brethren listened to Paul's words. By faith, they grasped the wonderful truth of Christ's atoning sacrifice and received him as their redeemer. They were then baptized in the name of Jesus. And as Paul laid his hands upon them, they received also the baptism of the Holy Spirit, by which they were in a, able to speak the languages of other nations and to prophesy. Thus, they were qualified to labor as missionaries in Ephesus and its vicinities, and also to go forth to proclaim the gospel in Asia Minor. Now, the point I want you to notice about this part where it's underlined and in italics, they were then baptized in the name of Jesus. Whereas in many places, Ellen White quotes scripture, here she's making a specific statement without quotation marks. She's saying they baptized in the name of Jesus. In Desire of Ages. We've got a microphone open somewhere. Thank you for closing it. Uh, before I go to this slide, let me, let me just go back and, and speak about a principle. Many times when Ellen White would be teaching or writing, she would quote a verse or several verses without commentary, either figuring the verses themselves spoken well or that they simply, she was simply quoting the verses to, to sustain her position or to make her, uh, make the, the, the material with which she was speaking flow and have a, a, a beginning and ending and a, and a middle, if you please. And and so even though she quotes these verses in many places, I don't think she's usually trying to quote them. I can't, I can't say because I, I can't get into her mind. Her mind is not available to us tonight. But I think that her mind was not trying to do an exegesis on these individual scriptures each time. She's simply quoting them using the phraseology of the scriptures, which I don't think is ever a problem for us to do. But I want to keep us... In, in mind at this point in Desire of Ages on 181.2 as we close. And I'm sorry I went a little over time here, but hopefully we have enough time for questions. It is the grace of Christ that gives life to the soul. Apart from Christ, baptism, like any other service, is a worthless form. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life. The Desire of Ages 181, paragraph 2. So, we may want to get into a discussion. We may want to have argument. We may have great disputations about a quote, baptismal formula, end quote. I don't believe it's necessary uh, to, to have that kind of a argument over it. I think if we just look at the example of scriptures, we see how 
The disciples understood what Jesus said to do. We, we believe that Ellen White used these same phrases, just like the scripture uses them. And, uh, but above all, and first and foremost above all, we have to have the spirit of Christ in our lives. I'd just like to maybe make one more point about this name issue. Uh, maybe you've heard the expression, hocus pocus. I don't know if you've ever heard that or not. But it's like supposedly a, a magical expression, something like abracadabra. And as Christians, we don't believe in magical phrases, magical potions and things like that. We, we don't believe that God works that way. So, you know, if, if I think that just because I say certain words the right way that I can become accepted or my baptism is accepted or I as a minister and baptizing in the right way, just by saying the right words, that doesn't make it right. My spirit has to be right. The spirit of the candidate has to be right. I believe that the form of the baptism should be as right as we possibly can understand. I'm not detracting from that. But let's just make sure that first and foremost, our hearts are right and that your heart is right. As we go through getting near the end of this camp meeting, this great opportunity we've had to come together, to not only learn about how we can work together and how the church should function together, but to learn how Christ wants to function in us and how he wants to take our hearts and do something special with them. And so it's my prayer that this has been a blessing to you. And uh, if it's according to the uh, protocol we've been doing, we'll have prayer and then we'll take questions. So I'd invite you to kneel with me or bow your heads where you can. Father in heaven, we are thankful for your word. We're thankful for the great gift of the spirit of prophecy. We certainly don't want to uh, take either away. We want to study them both. We want to use all that you can give us. We are in a dark place. This world is dark and there's much darkness about us. And our minds are very frail. They're very um, weak. And so Father, we need all the help we can get. So please help us each as we um, also use each other as we discuss things, maybe ask or answer questions, remembering that iron sharpens iron. And so please give us your Holy Spirit, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.